So you're in the market for a new piano. But do you buy used? Do you buy new? Do you go with a trusted manufacturer? Do you go with someone you've never heard of? Today you're looking at 10 things to know before buying a Yamaha piano. We've got a lot of fun things to talk about today. Stick around. Hi, this is Ted with Alamo Music Center in beautiful downtown San Antonio, Texas. I'm Patrick Marr. You can find us online at alamomusic.com. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channels, check out our other videos, sign up for notifications, like our videos, leave us comments. We appreciate your support and we love to interact with you. Ted, Yamaha. Hey, great topic today. Have you ever heard of Yamaha? I've heard of Yamaha. They're, they're a small company, I believe. You know, founded a couple years ago. They make motorcycles mostly, right? They make all kinds of stuff. Watercraft. <laughs> they, they do a lot. Yamaha has become synonymous with quality. And, uh, and when looking for an instrument, almost any instrument, Yamaha comes up. And there's a reason for that. Um, and today we are tackling the subject of Yamaha pianos. Um, really exciting because we love Yamaha pianos. Yeah, you know, it's exciting because the beginning of Yamaha's manufacturing, you think of all the things they make. Mm -hmm. um, the beginning of their manufacturing actually started off with music instruments. Yeah, it's, it's a very cool story. And so I think the first thing that people need to know is Yamaha's story. I think it's, it's, a, it's got a, a unique journey. Pride of craftsmanship it, and journey. Yeah, and, and, it's, uh, and it's rooted all the way back in 1887. Their first instrument was? A reed organ. A reed organ. That was personally delivered. I think the first five or ten or number of these things were personally ordered and then personally delivered by Mr. Yamaha himself after being manufactured. And then as he went along, he started taking on some yeah. assistance. Yeah, I think he, he was originally a, a watchmaker, which is cool too. So he's into precision, into fine craftsmanship. Fine craftsmanship. But yeah, reed organ was the first instrument that Yamaha, the company, did. Um, and uh, Yamaha didn't make their first piano until 1900. Um, and so at that point, they start ramping up production. Um, and then Mr. Yamaha dies in 1916. And, you know, a lot of companies, that would be the end. Well, I, I really like what he infused in the, in the, the company mentality, mm -hmm. which is they wanted to be the best manufacturing company that they could be, but they only wanted to make leisure products. And the idea was that the belief is that most people had factory jobs. Mm -hmm. So while you work your factory job all day long and, you know, Japanese custom, you're happy in your work, you think about how, how you're going to spend your money mm -hmm. and your leisure time. So a leisure product. Yeah. And one thing leads to another and it's always a leisure pot product, a motorcycle, a boat, a boat motor, uh, all the musical instruments that they make. And so, yeah, and so it's interesting because at that point uh, when he died, a fam another family took over um, and kept the Yamaha name out of honor. Um, and then post-World War II, after, you know, a lot of manufacturers in the United States also at the time in World War II started manufacturing, you know, things for the war effort. War effort. Um, Yamaha, no different, but then they retained the motorcycle division at that point. Um, and that's kind of where it started branching out into, into uh, away from just musical instruments. Um, and it's just interesting, though, that, that because of, of his skill, because of like, the story of how he started with a reed organ and, and produced a piano and, and the journey that he went on, there was, there was such honor and, uh, and, well, and continuing that mission. Um, and, and today that mission lives on and Yamaha incorporates that and you know, their marketing efforts in their vision for the company, it's still about creating the best instrument they can and bringing it to whoever they need to at, at, any, at any level. Um, and so I, th I think that that's, that's our, our, first, our first thing that you need to know about Yamaha. Well, he was thrilled to set up a company because he was manufacturing something and what attracted him to the reed organ was the number of working components and parts, the same thing that would attract someone to building a piano. And like you said, as being a former watchmaker, well, you're not working with magnifying glasses all the time. It's like bigger And it comes alive things. at and the end. And it comes alive at the and end. And so yeah. it's, it's pretty neat to, to see musical instruments, watches, things like that come alive at the end when you're done. Um, so first thing, attention to quality and the story and history of Yamaha. Our second thing, kind of harking back um, to our intro, but Yamaha is 
the largest manufacturer of musical instruments in the entire world. Um, I, a couple years ago, I heard a statistic, don't quote me on this, but one in every four instruments that are made, any instrument, are Yamaha that's certainly branded believable. instrument. That's I'm, certainly believable. I heard that. It's, it was more of a cool story. I don't know if it's 100% true. I but think they're about one of the, f if not the only one of the very, very few limited companies that still manufacture a true classical Celeste, which is like a piano with xylophone keys. Oh, in wow. It. That's cool. And, and so symphony orchestras mm -hmm. around the world will have a Celeste, and they don't have tons of keys on them. Mm -hmm. But it is used in the Nutcracker almost yeah, every no, it's, year. So. It's interesting because Yamaha, if you look at a symphony, you could point, especially at, at, at some of, you know, when you look at a professional symphony, there's all sorts of old instruments and really cool stories of where those instruments came from. But if you look at, you know, a, a high school orchestra or, um, you know, a youth orchestra somewhere, you can start pointing out a lot of Yamaha instruments oh, yeah. throughout the line. So there could be a Yamaha piano on stage, and then Yamaha marimbas, and then Yamaha and oboes, and, and everything you look at can be a Yamaha instrument. Basically. Because their manufacturing is so worldwide large, a lot mm -hmm. of people don't realize that Yamaha does do custom type work. They make extremely expensive top end of line instruments of almost anything they make. It's not that they're producing it every day, mm -hmm. but they do make extremely expensive rare wood guitars and they do the same thing with their um, symphonic instruments like bassoons and oboes. They make incredibly expensive, finely detailed best instruments in the world. And if you look at those too, it, it's they're high quality. Oh, it's, it's just incredible to see that the, the quality of craftsmanship to me, it's point. nice to see how everything works at the affordable level because that's kind of where I've lived most of my mm -hmm. life. But in dealing with some of the finer, higher end instruments here at the store, you realize, man, these guys don't cut any corners anywhere. It's like the more expensive and the, 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 the more pricey an instrument is, the more you can see the labor yeah. and the effort and everything so, in it. An incredible manufacturer, the largest, great rich history. Um, but our third thing that you we think you need to know, especially when looking at um, pianos is the product categories um, and so within the piano line it can get very expansive e expansive it, it's very expansive um, yeah. and it's important to know where you're looking um, I think that is the most important thing and to do a little research and to look hey am I more interested in their digital side of things the acoustic side of things their hybrid side of things I'm looking for portability am I looking for um, the longevity of the instrument am I looking for performance is instrument um, there is a lot of going on in their product lines, whether you just in the digital side. So we have a, a CLP 725 behind us. Um, it looks very similar to the YDP series. Um, so there's the YDP series, the CLP series, the CVP series, the CSP series. The, and so there's, that's just within in-home digitals. And it's really nice because there's a lot of overlapping of not just the the product capabilities, but the features within certain products. Yeah, how to use them, it starts to, to make sense, but I think it's important to realize where you want to go when you do finally start looking for that right Yamaha piano for you. Um, there is very in-depth product lines, and you can go one direction and start looking at acoustics, and then go a completely different direction, look at hybrid instruments. Um, they make great hybrid instruments, the NU1X, um, the N1X, the N2X, N3X, those are hybrid instruments, the kind of an in-between of acoustic and digital. They also have uh, hybrids on the other side where it's, uh, it's taking silent technology on acoustic instruments and you can take an acoustic upright and turn it into a completely quiet instrument. So really know your product line, know kind of where you want to go, what, what are the needs you need, do you need it to be quiet at some times of the day, do you need it to not have to be tuned, do you not want maintenance, routine maintenance, does it need to be portable? These are all questions and we have some other videos that kind of highlight the questions you should ask yourself going into to buying a piano. Um, but this is really important in Yamaha because there is so much diversity, diversity within their line. Um, kind of having an idea of what the product selections are would be a huge benefit to buying, buying the it, instrument. It, it really is, particularly with um, some of the features that are showing up in a lot of the different keyboards. You have, for instance, just the record feature. Just the record feature alone starts to overlap into so many different products. It starts off on the portable keyboards. Mm -hmm. It gets better on the, uh, the CLP and the YDP line. It's, it's available there. But when you get to the higher end CLP and CVP, it becomes a 16-track studio. That 16-track studio concept kind of leads into the other keyboard side, which is the, the, uh, the Tyros and the higher end, um, 
what is that 900 or 9000 series, which are a lot like the Clavinovas. Mm -hmm. And all of this technology has this overlap. And there's one area of the market you don't want to forget, and that's the experimental electronic music guys. What they're looking for is just something, maybe a great basic piano to trigger, mm -hmm. and they're going to drive a bunch of other instruments with it, or they're going to use computers to drive the insides of, of that unit. So a lot of times these Yamaha bass units serve as a foundation for guys that are doing a lot of experimental yeah. recording and, and just technological. And, and to that point, sometimes you could think you're looking at a keyboard, but really it's a controller. And so it's really just important to know the product offerings, know what Yamaha has to offer and right. where you kind of want to go with that knowledge. Um, there are lots of stores, lots of online places where you can kind of find help on that, but um, it can be it can be a, a challenge at points. Um, other thing we wanted to talk about, I guess this is number four on our list, <coughs> manufacturer partnerships and manufacturer connections throughout Yamaha's history. I think this is always a cool thing to touch on. I think that's one of their major influences is uh, not necessarily starting up companies, but finding companies that either come to them or they go to and say, hey, together we can make a lot of things yeah. work. Yeah, and so I think that started way back when, um, going back in history again, but the first technician that worked with Yamaha was Koichi Kawai, uh, and that story is just really cool because eventually Kawai branched off, did his own thing, and Kawai became a, a, another powerhouse in the piano, in the piano world, um, and so just that has happened multiple times throughout Yamaha's history in 1995, they had uh, Pearl River. They did a 10-year plan, I think, with, mm -hmm. with Pearl River. They wanted to build a factory in, in China. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Chinese government said, well, why don't you build a factory for our Pearl River company? And in the process, you can show how to build an engineer and lay out a factory, train and work with uh, the staff and employees over a 10-year period, and then you can open up your own factory. In China, yeah. And that was a major boost in the arm for Pearl River just in terms of the high quality jump that their instruments took and the consistency in their in their productivity and delivering a, a decent piano over and over and over and mm -hmm. over again. That was really nice. And then they even went so far as to invent their own top of the line piano from the Pearl River factory. And that was about the end of the Yamaha relationship up through the development of the Rittmuller yeah. line. And then after that, Yamaha started doing a lot of their lower end entry line pianos and entry line digital started uh, to get China. managed. Yeah, the B series um, and some of their GB1s, I think, are made in Indonesia and China. And they originally did. When they had the Cable Nelson name and they were building those, mm -hmm. they built a lot of those over in the those, Pearl River in those first and the, plants. So just knowing the connections, I, they're, one of our favorite ones also is the acquisition of Bosendorfer um, in 2008. Yamaha um, saw a, a struggling higher end piano company that you know makes a fantastic instrument, and they they invested heavily into Bosendorfer, and they actually ended up buying Bosendorfer as part of their line. Um, and just a really cool connection. So number four is the connection with other manufacturers um, and that, that lifeblood that kind of flows through all these musical instrument right. manufacturers. Just a really cool, cool story. Um, that's not even counting the story of how they got into manufacturing chips, and that's a whole different thing. But they're, oh, microchips? They're, they're microchips and, mm -hmm. and converting from uh, into the new digital. And about the time that they decided to get into building chips was just as they were changing from the old type of transistors into the new, uh, the new type of chips, and that was a major hundreds of million dollar investment mm -hmm. for Yamaha, and it took off well, they, about three, four years they later. They bought sequential circuits, too, oh, back did. in the day. So there's shout out to our, our, uh, um, our pro audio channel that, that reviews, uh, it's called the Alamo Lab. Um, and uh, the Sound Lab, and so they do uh, synthesizer reviews, but you look at some sequential circuits, some Yamaha, maybe a CS80 will appear at some point, but Yamaha had a really cool history within the synthesizer world as well, late 70s, early 80s. Um, but back to pianos, number five on our list is the used market and the gray market. And so this, I would say, is controversial. I say it's the same. It, it's, it's interesting It's interesting because there is, once you start looking up things about Yamaha um, and looking, especially in their C series, their conservatory series and their U series, their professional upright series, there is a plethora of refurbished, manufactured, remanufactured units that um, 
and it, it's such an, such an issue for Yamaha that they've released press statements and um, statements on what they call gray market pianos. Um, and it's, it's interesting, and this I'm sure some of you guys have read about this, and please leave comments on your opinion. But a lot of dealers around the country sell a lot of these instruments, gray market, at a, you know, at a fraction of the price of what a new one would cost, a comparable new one. Um, and uh, you know, we've also dabbled in that as well. And, and, and it's pretty interesting because they're very quality and, and, uh, and again, a fraction of the price well, of a new one. Number one, I never liked the term gray market. It just brings all that dark stigma of a gray market piano, like the day they set it up in your house and the legs, the legs fall off, everything comes apart yeah. and the strings spring out. Well, we, we've I mean, seen, a were, and, and I've well, seen a lot of old pianos. I've seen a lot of old pianos that never came close to that. I mean, yeah. the worst looking piano I've ever seen was the one that got beat up by the Blue Man Group. They'd hit it with a hammer and everything. And that was an old Yamaha, believe it or not. And, so and it, so it, it is interesting because a gray market piano doesn't mean that it's any less of an instrument than it was the day it was manufactured. And of course, you'll want to get a technician to look at it. You'll want to make sure you know there's some sort of guarantees with purchasing one. Um, but really, do not I are don't be afraid to look at pianos and and make your own assumptions and get expert help on it. Um, there is a lot of scare tactics that there do was, go on. I think the primary reason was was twofold. Number one, Yamaha was worried about losing any headway they may have on brand new piano manufacturing. Uh, as having these other used, refurbished, or remanufactured unit as a competitor of their own, with and, their they're, own name and they on don't it. play like a like a brand new, brand new piano. They play very well. They've been reconditioned. They play like maybe it did right when it came in the '80s or in the '70s. Um, but it's it. I it, to your point, I, I there's some really great options out there at an affordable price. Um, the idea for this seasoned for destination with their. Uh, tempering of the soundboard and the, and the frames and all that, I think was something that came up as a result is that they did not want to be held to a manufacturer's warranty for anything that may have been bought and purchased brand new as mm -hmm. a piano, say, in the Philippines, and then taken to the coast of Maine and start to have manufacturing problems yeah, with it. So and so they tried to limit a lot of that liability, which is certainly understandable. Their instruments were all over the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... At the same time, it doesn't mean that the pianos they once built are no longer any good. Because a lot yeah. of the times we get them when they're remanufactured, there's different steps. They yeah, there's different. They pull processes. the frame out, strip it, repaint it. They replace or repair the soundboard mm -hmm. or, or tighten up the frame. They they actually build a brand new piano inside. Yeah, and the so the, there's different one. levels of what what uh, remanufacturing refurbish mean. Um, and it's just it's important to to be open to to looking at something that maybe. Um, can seem scary, but if you take the right approach, you can really end up with a great buy. Um, same with the used market. And so the used market of Yamahas is very strong. There's a lot of Yamaha products because there's been a lot of Yamaha purchased. Um, and so the used market kind of maintains a very nice, steady um, price that rides, a, rides around um, uh, kind of a consistent, it doesn't fall off ever. Right. Um, having a Yamaha has inherent value um, and really a lot of re retainment of, of what you've put into it. Um, and so, the used market and the, and the gray market are are great options if you're not willing if you're not looking to spend buku's amount of money. There, it's definitely worth checking out. Um, I'm not going to say it compares to a brand new Yamaha because I do believe there's big vast differences, um, but there there are opportunities. And so that's something we did want to bring up. I think it's an important thing to know before going in and buying a Yamaha. It's important to know these things, form your own opinions, look at the data. Um, and and just you know make an informed decision. We're not going to tell you what's right or wrong, but there there are some great values out there. Um, and so that's five. That's our used market and the gray market of Yamaha. Six. I want to talk about. Let's bring it back to the U.S. Made in the U.S.A. There's some really cool Yamahas out there. Talking about the used market, Yamaha actually had um, for about 25 years had a, at a uh, factory in Thomaston, Georgia, um, which is a really cool story. I think they at first were making like an electric organ type thing out of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then a couple years later, later in the early 80s started making um, you know, their T-series, their M-series, these um, really nicely appointed in-home acoustic uprights um, that, uh, that play great, they sound great. People really kind of seek them out because it's a Yam it says Yamaha on the, on the fall board. You look at the back, it says made in the USA. It's just a, it's a, cool, a cool instrument. Those pianos have a very distinctive 
different sound than the, the similar alike models that were not made in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And if you, I'm sure you've noticed in the last 10 to 15 years, whenever we get in a Thomaston, Georgia, Yamaha, it's those are the first ones to sell. They sell like that. Yeah, they like, sell right away. It, yeah. It's it's they're special pianos. They're cool. I don't know. A lot of it's probably the the. The marketing power American behind American psychology. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and forgive our nationalism of right. that, I guess, a little bit. But it they, they do make a very and, and Yamaha makes a great instrument. Having it made in America makes it a little bit shinier. Um, and uh, and it's it's they're just really cool instruments. So yeah, some of those are really cool. I think they made it from like '83 to early 2000s, um, and then they they shut that factory plant down. Right as they started to make their first, they were making the four foot eleven grand pianos there. Just Oof. as they started making those is when they were starting to shut down the place. They shut, and, and in correlation with that Pearl River uh, agreement in China, where they eventually moved manufacturing back to overseas, to China. Um, and they always had that Japanese facility open, but these were American market pianos that they were making, um, a little bit more furni American furniture style. Right. So number six is the Made in the USA story, a very cool Yamaha story. Um, number seven that we wanted to talk about is the technology. Yamaha, I think, I would say, especially in the piano world, unparalleled. Cutting edge. They are cutting the edge. First. Yeah, they they are, they are it. They're they're it when it comes to technology. And in 2021, a lot of companies have caught up, have used um, plays out of their playbook, and said, "Hey, you know, we need we need to make that. We need to do this." But Yamaha was the first to really master the player piano, the modern player piano. They're the first to master the in-home digital piano. Um, they were the first to really start mastering the hybrid piano and silent pianos. I have and a theory for that about Yamaha. Okay, yeah. And the theory is that it actually started with the disc clavier. Mm -hmm. And that was a product that was based on acquiring a certain patent for a specific component inside the player unit. And uh, out of the old Marantz Corporation, Yamaha purchased those solenoids mm -hmm. that drive a disc clavier. And what happened when they had those disc claviers and that technology was purchased, it was right on the cutting edge of beginning to where manufacturers were looking down the low line of making analog instruments, but knowing full well that digital was starting to creep in and that the future was gonna have different kind of uh, electronic components starting with computer chips in it. By putting the disc clavier together, Yamaha literally had to take divisions that never worked together bunch of woodworkers and piano makers all of a sudden had to hang around a bunch of guys that were probably a third their age, electronic nerds with soldering irons, to make an experimental player piano. Mm -hmm. And from there, that merging of those two divisions, their electronic division and the piano division into like a new disc clavier division, actually, that's when the digital piano started to come out because they started realizing these chips can do other things mm -hmm. like hold recordings of sounds. Yeah. Even though they were 8-bit they were recordings, it was the beginning. And that was, I think it was the beginning of merging these different divisions within Yamaha to create new products. And, and to that point, Yamaha takes it from a very in-home approach. They, everything they do is gonna be top down with them. Leisure products. Leisure products. And so it's important to know, um, it's kind of like the apple, the apple of, of the piano world, um, if you think about it, because you know it's, your iPhone works a lot better when it's connected to a MacBook and it works a lot better when the system's updated and when you have the newest one. And so so there is, take the good with the bad, there is there is a, a lot of value to having it all in-home Yamaha, but there are limitations because of that. Uh, but really strong technology, the leader in most cases on all fronts of technology. A lot of manufacturers have caught up, so the, you know, the player systems, uh, the in-home digitals, uh, all that all that stuff is available on uh, on other products now and other other manufacturers have those options but Yamaha was the first and and kind of retains the in-home approach to it and so a lot of technology comes straight from them to you really a cool a cool concept so number seven the technology aspect of, of Yamaha number eight on our list Yamaha is a very loved instrument in schools in universities and at the competition level it's one of a handful of names that you'll see on a concert stage in front of thousands of people as the premier instrument on that stage it's very limited who makes that list um, but yamaha is definitely on it 
especially at the higher end, especially in universities. It's a trusted, it's a trusted name, um, especially since they offer not just pianos, but they have all these other instruments. And so a lot of teachers, a lot of educators firmly believe in Yamaha. It's a great endorsement of, of their product and say, hey, you know, you can spend more on, on, on a nicer instrument, but to get the quality, it's going to be hard pressed to find something right. that's, uh, that's this level and at this price point. Um, and so just a really, really the endorsements of that, of yeah, those band accolades. Band directors too. Yeah, the, band the directors. Individuals. I mean, they know that half these kids are on Yamaha instruments, which means half my band is not going to have a problem. Yeah. And that's especially at junior high and high school level. Yeah. Because you need great working instruments at that. And so choir teachers too love the clavinovas, love the love the instruments. So number number eight on our list is definitely the endorsements from schools, universities, and from competitions around the world. Yamaha, you'll see it there, front and center. Um, number nine on our list, technicians friend. Yamaha, everything I've ever heard from Yamaha from technicians is oh, it's so easy to work on. You know, I, I was working on one from the 70s. I was working on from the 80s, 90s really hold up really greatly manufactured they just you know a lot of the technicians that we've known over the years have owned p22s yamaha's upright right. and, it, and it's um it's a testament to how sturdy sturdily built these these instruments are um and kind of what they have to offer yeah the the other thing too about the uh the, the technician's friend is that a lot of times you have the the instruments and as they age they require a certain amount of, you know, maintenance. Yeah. And the Yamahas are just easy to maintain. That's why a lot of technicians like them. Even in, you know, Larry Fine's piano book, says most of the Yamahas are blah, blah. I mean, I've only seen a very, very small handful in all my years of Yamaha spinet pianos because spinets are notorious for having tuning problems on that break. Mm -hmm. And I know that Yamaha didn't build them very long at all. There's yeah. very few many of them. There's very limited amounts of those out there. Yeah. But that's something that, you know, it just takes well to getting repaired. Even their, their woodwinds, you replace the pads, the keys, and all those kind of things are just really kind of neat. It's just yeah, no, it's 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 built with the with the idea that this is going to need to be maintained, and that's an important part of the instrument. And having you know the, pro, the having the the tools available and the ease of craftsmanship creates it, the ease of and maintenance. And it's not just the technicians too. I, I do have to say that anytime you've watch a sales guy unpack a new Yamaha instrument, even if it's just one of their entry line guitar packs. The packaging and how that stuff is shipped, as well as the crating and the uncrating of a piano, is you can actually tell how much pride and craftsmanship there is based on the quality of the packing job they do to get it to the retailer mm -hmm. unharmed. And you've seen some of the other pianos come in and some of these other instruments that come in in those flimsy boxes that are already corrugated Ripped. and broken apart and that you pull the instrument case out whereas Yamaha it's all foamed up sealed and everything. I mean it, it says a lot yeah and and the customers I mean you can always uncrate anything in front of anything Yamaha uncrate it in front of a customer and you know they're going to be impressed yeah it, so I, I think uh, that brings us to number 10 yeah. right? that number 10 is Ted's favorite on our list the tuning forks the tuning forks that's it it is one of the most recognized logos in the world. Mm -hmm. And the only one or two that are in front of it is the Coca-Cola logo, uh, possibly Pepsi, and McDonald's. And the number three recognized logo around the world is the tuning forks from Yamaha. So it's three tuning forks. If you ever look at the Yamaha logo. It's three tuning forks unless you, you're, you're looking at, this is the interesting thing. It's always three tuning forks, but those tuning forks extended beyond the circle, okay, belong to the motor division. The motor division. Mm -hmm. And those are guys that their tuning forks are just a little bit longer. They don't they exceed outside the circle of the tuning forks. So so just some cool trivia there, but a, a kind of a, a neat thing to know about Yamaha is their expansion outward and and the heart of their message is still music at the center and um, and it's, 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 a very, it's a very cool story. So those are our top 10 things to know before buying a Yamaha. Um, if you have any other tips that you would want to give potential buyers, please leave some comments. I know they'll appreciate it. It's always a scary process looking for the right instrument. Yamaha is a pretty trusted brand. Um, they have our stamp of approval on, on a, a quality instrument um, at, at a, a, good, a good price for the most part. Again, there are used options. There are other options. Um, but just in incredible value, incredible instruments, 
This is our top 10 for Yamaha. This is Ted Barcelona, I'm Patrick Marr. Thank you guys for watching.